So we're here today to uh, tax and business basics for self-employed. My name is Stephen Taylor. I am the trainer for the Idaho State Tax Commission. Here's what we're going to cover today. We're going to talk about registering your business, uh, selling products and what that means, the permits that you may need, uh, how to handle invoices and receipts, what to do with tax exempt transactions, uh, reporting that needs to be done, and then the electronic access and resources that you have available to you. The first part is starting your business. Um, we recommend that you go to business.idaho.gov slash register dash a dash business and register uh, the name of your business with the Secretary of State. Uh, it does cost a little bit and it depends varying on, on what the business is, uh, but it is not a lot. Once you're registered, so you make sure that your name is, is safe and secure for your business, we really recommend getting an EIN. Now, an EIN is not required uh, unless you have employees, but if you don't have one, you'll need to use your Social Security number for business purposes, and a lot of people really don't want to do that. Totally understandable. The nice thing is that EINs are free, and they're easy to get, so we recommend them even if you don't need one. And then just... Some banks require an EIN to open up a business account, so it might be good to get one. After that, then you want to apply for permits at tax.idaho.gov slash IBR, and I'm going to cover that in more detail here in just a second. Once you have your permit numbers, then you're going to want to create an account in TAP at idahotap.gentax.com slash TAP. And then somewhere in there, get a website, and they'll open up your business bank accounts. So there's a lot of steps. Uh, the first four probably should be done in sequence. Uh, you can't open up a TAP account until you get your permit numbers. So I would apply for permit numbers first and then get your TAP account. So what does all this mean? Well, it means if you're selling tangible personal property, um, Idaho has a 6% sales tax on that. Now that tax is not part of your income, it belongs to the state, and you're just collecting it for us. What is tangible personal property? Um, it is anything that you can touch, pick up, carry, eat, or otherwise handle that's not including real property. And then generally speaking, taxes are not, taxes, <laughs> sorry. Generally speaking, services are not taxable in Idaho. So if you're selling tangible personal property, you're going to need seller's permits. Uh, because any sale of tangible personal property that you make in the state of Idaho requires you to collect sales tax, uh, unless there's an exemption. Um, and there are lots of exemptions. We're just going to discuss one of the more common ones here in the next slide. And that is what happens when you ship goods to another state. For instance, uh, you charge Idaho sales tax if the buyer arranges shipping or picks up the goods because they are taking possession of it in Idaho. You are not going to charge Idaho sales tax on goods that are delivered to another state by your company vehicle or by a common carrier. So if it's delivered to Oregon, you're not going to charge Idaho sales tax. Oregon's a bad example. They don't have tax. Um, let's say California. Uh, you send something to California, you don't charge Idaho sales tax because they didn't take possession of it until it came to California. That being said, you may be responsible for collecting the sales tax from that state. And that is something that you're going to have to do some research on to figure out at what point do you become responsible for collecting sales tax to another state. Because that uh, trigger varies depending on the state. So the key difference here is where the customer takes possession of that product. If you deliver it or arrange shipping to another state, you still have possession of it until it reaches final destination. And then once the transfer of property takes place in the other state, there's no Idaho sales tax due. If the buyer comes to Idaho, picks up the good, they arrange for the shipping, or they took possession of it in Idaho, the transaction is taxable for Idaho sales tax. Does that make sense? So, as I mentioned, if you're shipping a lot of goods to a specific state, you want to research that state's threshold for sales taxes. Some of them it's $10,000 worth of sales. Some of them it is on that first sale. 
and it's because of the Wayfair versus South Dakota decision several years ago. Um, this allows states to collect sales tax for items shipped into their states, uh, but each state has different requirements. Um, now, if you're using our marketplace to sell your goods, check and see if they're actually doing that for you, they're collecting sales tax. Uh, most of them do. Okay. So we know we need to collect sales tax on, on some of our goods that we sell. So to do that, we're going to have to have permits. So where do we get those Idaho accounts? or permits. We're going to go to tax.idaho.gov and then where it says online services right between the A and the H in Idaho if you just hover over online services a menu will drop down and you'll need to go to apply for a business permit and then once you click on business permit You'll open up to this window, scroll down to where it says to apply, where the arrow is, and it's the Idaho Business Registration, or IBR, application. Um, if you contact uh, the tax reps, um, they may tell you about the IBR, and that's what that is, Idaho Business Registration. So once you clicked on that, you'll open up to this shiny new website. It's been redesigned. It's pretty easy to read now. The IBO reform goes into the Idaho Department of Labor, the Idaho Industrial Commission, and then it goes to the Idaho State Tax Commission. Um, the Idaho State Tax Commission gets it last. Um, so you may get your permits from other agencies first, and it can take several weeks to get your permits. Okay. So this is just kind of a list of all of the things that are going on that you may need and then why you would want to fill this out. When you're ready to proceed, just click on the blue button down there in the bottom of the arrow, and you'll go to another similar looking window. And this is just listing information that may be needed to proceed. Now, obviously, you're not going to need all of this. If you're just a sole proprietorship, you probably don't have a board of directors, so you're not going to need board of director member information. It's just listing everything that you may need. Double check, make sure you have the big points that you think you're going to need, and just hit I have the required information, I'm ready to proceed. Um, Skyler has a question. If I'm a sole proprietorship providing a service, do I need to do the IBR? If you're not selling any product, probably not. I have PJ on the line. Let me have her answer this real quick. Hey, PJ, you with me? I am. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah. Skylar, you are correct. If you are not selling tangible products, you are not a retailer and you only provide a service, then um, no, you do not need to have an IBR application for sales tax. But if you're going to have employees, yes, you'll have to do it to get, obtain the unemployment and the payroll withholding for this. Oh, thanks. You want me to just leave you off of mute, PJ? Yeah, that would be fine. Okay, good. Okay, great. So once we click on that button, we are going to create a new account. So the first time we get in here, we're just going to create a new account. Um, and then you're going to go through a whole series of questions. Uh, just answer the questions. When you're done answering them, the IBR application will figure out what permits you need based on the information that you gave. Okay. Now, if you've completed an IBR registration and you need uh, to add some more info, you'll have to create a new account. Uh, accessing an earlier account that's already been submitted will only let you see what's already been done. And that is absolutely fine. It's not going to double up everything else. The system will figure it out for you. So if you start with a sole proprietorship, it's just you, and so you're getting your seller's permits, and then a year later, you know, it's going really well. You're going to hire a couple of people. Fantastic you're going to need to come in here and probably change information because now you're going to need to have uh, withholding accounts created. You can't go into your old one and do that, so you'll have to create a new one and fill out the information to get those withholding accounts. Okay. So that's how you get your permits. It's actually pretty easy. It's a lot easier than it used to be. So what do we do for invoices and receipts? Um, Sales tax has to be a separate line item on an invoice or receipt. 
Oops, what do we got here? We got a question. How do we know for sure if there if we are a service or in retail? Uh, for example, this is from Madison. I'm an illustrator who makes art for clients. I am selling art, but since it's a custom product, is it a service or a product? Well, that's a product, right, PJ? Correct. If you're handing them that art, um, they have ownership of that piece of art. It is a retail sale. Because it is something they can handle. Correct. Remember, so it's tangible. So you'd want to get your permits. Good question, Madison. Okay, um, where were we? Sales tax has to be a separate line item on an invoice or a receipt. Includes tax isn't acceptable. Yes, digital art would also be a product. Yep, because technically you're, it's, it's a file. So. Uh, retailers can't advertise that they'll pay the tax for a customer or advertise that there is no sales tax. And these rules are kind of in place for your benefit. Um, if we allow people to say no sales tax uh, or it's included, there's no documentation of how much sales tax was included. And we would have to make some assumptions. And we don't want to assume anything. So uh, making sure it's documented and spelled out um, is for your benefit as well. So I'd make sure you're doing that. So uh, James asked, I'm assuming digital art is also a product. Uh, yes, it is. So here's a sample invoice. We're just gonna walk through what this means. This is from Awesome Auto Repair, and it is for a brake job. And I just had this done in my truck, and $400 is very cheap, because mine was $1,200. <laughs> so what we have listed here, we have two brake pads. So two brake pads at $50 a piece for a total of $100. And you'll notice in that taxable column, <laughs> it says T, and that's for taxable. And then we had two brake shoes at $100 a piece uh, for $200, and that was taxable. And then we have the labor for $100, and it's not taxable because it's service. So that's not actually taxable the way this is set up. So we have $300 that is taxable, and at 6%, that $300 is $18. So we have $400 subtotal, $18 in sales tax, total due is $418. So, uh, hang on, I'm getting bombarded with email. <laughs> Let me reply to this email real quick. Okay. Uh, so, and Jamie, I'm sorry, I called you James before. Uh, Jamie, one more quick uh, product or service question. If we are editing someone else's text document, then that would be a service, right? Even though there is passing back and forth of the author's manuscript? Correct. Correct, yeah. Thanks, PJ. So that's how you want your sample invoice, your, your sample, that's how you want your invoices or receipts to be listed out. You want it to be specifically noted what was taxable and how much that was. So what is this? This is an, Form ST101. Um, if you're buying for resale, you're wholesaling or producing items for sale, or if you have a statutory exemption, you can buy your products exempt from sales tax using this form. Um, now, you may also receive these from your customers, so you're not required to collect tax from them. So, ST101, we're going to go into this in a little more detail. These are the instructions for this. There's a total of four pages that go along with this, and they explain many of the exemptions and what's going on. So I, I would read it. Make sure you have it handy. What the actual form looks like is this. We have buyer's name, seller's name, addresses, information like that. Um, for most buyers, you're going to fall into uh, one of the first two categories on this page, and you only need to fill out one of them. So even if you have a seller's permit and you're a producer, so one and two, you don't need to fill out both. Just pick one. If you sell retail in Idaho, you're going to need to include your seller permit number. 
and then sellers who are qualifying for other exemptions, they don't need that permit number. So you'll fill out the list, the primary nature of your business, describe the products that you sell, your rent or your lease, and then put in your seller's number right there, or have them put it in there for you. Now, if you're a producer, you have producer exemptions. Um, basically, what you need to do is what the business you are in uh, producing, and then what exemption you're applying for. If you are in farming and mining, click them both. That's fine. If you're a producer, you don't need a seller permit number to get the exemption, but you still need one if you're going to make sales. Um, this is going to allow you to purchase your supplies without paying tax on them, but it doesn't apply to everything that you buy, only to your supplies directly related to your business. And just be aware that the buyer is responsible for verifying the validity of the ST-101, uh, just by verifying the sales permit number is correct and valid. Uh, the nice thing is that you can easily do that in TAP, which I will go over here in just a little while. So those are ST-101s. You may run into those. This is just a heads up of what those are. They are not super complicated, and you don't need to turn them in to anybody. Uh, you just need to hang on to them for your records. Now reporting. Sales tax is due in the reporting period that the sale took place. Uh, you can't defer sales tax, and you are required to file a return even if you didn't have any sales for that particular reporting period. Um, an example of this, let's say you're actually buying a cell phone. So you went to Verizon or T-Mobile or AT&T, whomever, and you bought a new cell phone. You got the fancy new Samsung S85, whatever it is. <laughs> The company will usually let you take it with no money down, and then you're going to make payments uh, along with your bill. However, there will be an initial outlay of class. Uh, James, yes, this is how you're going to ask questions. Um, then, um, <laughs> train of thought just left without me. Sorry. So you're going to be required to pay tax on that before you leave with the phone, though. So there's going to be an initial outlay of money, and that is going to be the sales tax on the value of that phone. And why are you paying that right now? Because you took possession of that phone, right? So this is when you would pay sales tax, when you take possession of something. Now, if it's a lease or you have some other different kind of situation where you're not actually buying it, you may be paying sales tax uh, with, along with each um, monthly lease payment. I know there are some, some that do that. But if you're actually just buying it and making payments on it, you're gonna pay that sales tax up front. So reporting the sales and use taxes. Um, we're going to go through what this is. This is a Form 850. Okay. I'm going to look at this out part right here, this little inset. So what we're reporting is total sales. And we're just going to walk through this whole thing. So in our example, for this reporting period, we had $1,025 of total sales. We had $50 of non-taxable sales, and those non-taxable sales, uh, someone came in, bought something from us for $50, and they gave us an ST-101 saying they were exempt from paying sales tax. So we want to document that, right, because you didn't collect sales tax on that, so make sure that you have it in here. Um, so James, um, I'm going to answer your question, but if you see where it says send to, click that drop down and select all participants, okay? And then that comes into the main chat so everybody can see it. So James has a question. Um, if I buy a piece of equipment from a private party, do I pay tax for it and how? And I'm going to let PJ answer this. <laughs> Repeat that for me. Um, it says, he asked, if I buy a piece of equipment from a private party, do I pay tax for it and how? Well, it would be possibly an 850U, 
um, which you don't need a sales tax form for it. It's a use tax. It depends on if that vehicle has to be registered with the DMV, they will charge you Idaho sales tax. If it's a non-taxable item um, through the, uh, a private party, you most likely need to pay sales tax on it to us through an 850U form, which we can uh, explain to you later. It depends on what this item is and where you actually purchased it. Yeah, welcome to the world of tax, where the answer quite often is it depends. <laughs> um, for something like that, James, where it's, it kind of depends on certain situations, what I would recommend um, is sending an email or calling or coming in and asking the question along with your with your information, and they'll be able to come up with a more definitive answer for you. Okay. All right, so after we document our non-taxable sales, we're gonna put in um, our net. So this is our items that were actually subject to use tax. So 1025 minus the 50 for less than non-taxable sales gives us our subtotal of 975. Now, if we have uh, anything that's a use tax, we need to put that in here as well. So Use tax is something that we didn't pay sales tax on, but we should have <laughs> in very boiled down definition. So let's say we went to uh, we went to a state that doesn't collect sales tax, uh, Oregon, and we bought something for $25 in Oregon. Now we didn't pay sales tax on that, but we brought it back to Idaho and we're gonna use it. So we should have. So what we need to do is document that here, in which case we'll put our 25 in here. Now we have a whole video on sales and use tax, so it's another, it's almost another webinar in and of, in and of itself. So if you have questions about sales and use, I would recommend looking at that thing on our YouTube channel. Our 975 <clears throat> plus C, $25 for the, the use tax gives us our $1,000 total taxable sales. 6% of that is $60. And now adjustments. Adjustments occur when, let's say you sold a product and you collected sales tax on it, and then after you filed the taxes, the customer returned the item. So you refunded them their money, including the tax. Now you've paid tax and you've refunded it. So we're allowing you to claim it back on this line. Just be aware that if you put anything on this line, you're gonna to have to give us documentation of that transaction or that adjustment's gonna be denied. But this is where you would do it, under adjustments. Penalties and interest. Um, if you file late, there may be penalties and interest that apply. We suggest that you file the return without including the penalties and interest and let us calculate it for you. Um, the way that we calculate it is, is more accurate and up-to-date sometimes than what software will do. But once you've done all that, you'll have your final balance. And then once you have that final balance, you can send it along with the form to file the taxes. And then just remember, <laughs> if you collect sales tax from your customers, that money belongs to the state. So we're not taking that out of your profits. So for some reason, some people think that it's the profits that we're taking, and that, that is not the case. Questions on that? Okay. So I mentioned TAP, uh, that you could check seller's permits and TAP. There's a lot of things that we can do there. Um, to get to TAP, we're going to go to tax.idaho.gov, just like we did when we went to get our business uh, permits. Except this time, over on the right side, there's this little TAP icon. Steve, you have a question from James. It says, what do I do when a business sends me the product and doesn't charge sales tax and I sell it to someone else at no profit? Does it matter whether you make a profit or not? If you are selling a tangible item in Idaho, they would be required to pay sales tax. 
as a retailer, you can use your SC-101 form Steve was telling you about to purchase that item um, wholesale for resale. So your profit has nothing to do with whether you charge sales tax or not. So is that from James? Because that's not showing up here for me. I know it wouldn't allow me to answer it either. That's why I read it. Okay, okay. Thanks. You're welcome. Okay, so for tap, we're just gonna click on the little tap icon here. Uh, and we recommend that you set up a tap account as soon as you get your permits. Um, and you have to have the permits before you can set up the TAP account. Uh, and because we have security pre procedures that take some time, expect a delay a week or more before you can complete your TAP setup. So what can we do in TAP? I have said TAP 23 times so far. <laughs> what can we do in there? We can e-file returns. So we can e-file the sales and use taxes. Uh, if you have travel and convention taxes you need to file or auditorium district taxes, withholding taxes when you start getting employees, IFTA reports, beer and wine tax, all of those can be e-filed within TAP. You can make payments for sales and use taxes or travel and convention taxes, auditory and district taxes or withholding. Uh, you can also make payments for individual income taxes, business income taxes, and beer and wine taxes as well. So far there's a lot you can do in here. You can also validate the permits. So when I mentioned that you needed to validate seller's permits, this is where you would do it in this. You could validate seller's permits, cigarette permits, tobacco permits. What you can't do in TAP is apply for a permit. Do you know, remember where to go to get the permit instead of applying for it in TAP? Where do you go? Anybody? I, let's see what it says. I just exactly, Skylar. Perfect. <laughs> yep, Skylar, Sydney. Yep, you're going to go to the IBR, tax.idaho.gov. But yeah. And uh, PGA, are you checking for Sydney? Yes, I. Uh, sorry, someone was speaking to me, and <laughs> I do apologize. Um, you would if if cap doesn't recognize your information it can't if you don't have a permit on our system so if you're a sole proprietor and you're registered under your social security number cap will recognize you but your sales tax or your payroll withholding account won't show to you on tap and if you have an, uh, an ein number cap isn't going to recognize that information until you fill out the ibr Okay, so Sydney asked that she just signed up for a TAP account. I'm assuming you had all your permits already, and it did not receive an email. Uh, is it because it takes a while to process? You're not going to receive an original email. When you originally sign up from TAP, you tell it you don't have the authentication code, we mail it to you. Then when you get into TAP, if it does not send you an email, your authorization code, you would send an email to the e-file help desk and I would help you get into TAP at that point. Okay. Did you get that, Cindy? Thanks, VJ. Anytime. Hmm? So, I don't... Yeah, VJ, you're, you're a little quiet. There you go. The uh, the original authentication code for TAP is mailed, regular mail, never given over email or by the phone because it's used for identity verification, and you would have to receive that in the mail first before you can finish your registration. Perfect. And that's, that's much better, PJ. Thank you. You're welcome. Yeah, so you're going to get it in regular mail, so it might take a little while. I love the questions. Me too. <laughs> yeah, it's it's going to take, it may take a week or more. It's just everything is very busy right now. Correct. It is regular mail. Okay, let's talk about income taxes. Um, 
So far, we've discussed topics that relate mostly to the Idaho State Tax Commission. Uh, and so questions about those topics can be directed towards Tax Commission and to PJ and people like us. Um, I do have contact information on the last slide for them. Um, but there are a few items of importance to business owners that are from the IRS. Uh, so I'm going to go over that information. But first, a question. Let's see what it says here. It's not allowing me to answer on chat. It says having uh, having trouble getting chat to work. Yes. If I purchase a product from an online vendor and pay sales tax at the time of purchase and then install it on the customer's vehicle and resell it to them along with my service charges, do I charge sales tax to the customer on the top of the sales tax I already paid? Um, Yes, but on line seven, you would, could take an adjustment showing that you had paid sales tax on that item. That way you're not double taxed because that customer has to pay sales tax. So you could take a line seven adjustment on your 850 form and show proof that you already paid sales tax. Perfect, perfect. thank you. And there's another one from James. Sorry, Steve. If I haven't filed for the IBR yet, can I collect sales tax and, and account? No, you can't make sales without a sales tax permit in Idaho. In other words, apply for those permits now, James. <laughs> if, if it's slow getting the IBR, you always can do a temporary if you sales tax permit if you really have to make that sale. But any way you look at it, you have to have a sales tax permit in order to make sales in Idaho. And when you say nothing retroactive, what do you mean? Yes. Um, the problem is you're not supposed to make sales until you have a sales tax permit. So you can do a temporary seller's tax permit until we give you a permanent sales tax permit, but it isn't retroactive without penalty and interest. Let's say you apply now, but you've been making sales since April. You will pay penalty and interest for all of those months that you made sales without a permit because they were filed late. Excellent. Yeah, I don't know what's going on with chat. I, yeah, I don't know either. I'm not selling sales, just labor. Labor is not taxable. That's a service. I think that's the last one, Steve. Okay. okay. Yeah, I don't see any of those. So, so income taxes. Since we're talking about self-employment, there is something called self-employment tax. Uh, it includes FICA, Social Security, and Medicare. And you must pay this on your own if you're self-employed. Uh, even if you're starting a business as a side business, uh, this amount has to be paid. When you're employed by another company or another individual, usually these taxes are split between the employer and the employee. As self-employed, you're going to have to pay the full percentage. Uh, and it's recommended that you set aside at least 15.3% of your net profit to make sure that you have enough money to cover this. Uh, this is often paid quarterly uh, with estimated federal taxes, and this, again, is through the IRS. It's not through Idaho. And so if you need more information about it, I would go to irs.gov. Um, yeah, I don't know what I was going to say after that. <laughs> And this just kind of reiterates that when you're self-employed, uh, you're going to pay both the employer and the employee portions. Uh, it's due on the first dollar of your profit, and there is no standard deduction applied. We recommend 15.3%. And this is not the same as income tax, uh, but you're going to report it and pay payroll tax along with your federal taxes. And again, IRS.gov for this one. All right, let's talk about some good stuff. Deductible business expenses. So the IRS states that all deductible business expenses have to be incurred with the connection of your trade, your business, or your profession. They have to be ordinary and necessary, and they must not be lavish or extravagant under the circumstances. So they do have a lot of uh, expenses that you can deduct when you're running your business. Um, that last one, they must not be lavish or extravagant under the circumstances. If you buy a Lamborghini 
to deliver cupcakes for your business, they may consider that Lamborghini lavish or extravagant. Your cupcakes will get there very quickly, but probably not going to be able to have that deducted. So how do you do these deductions? You'd use a federal form 1040 Schedule C. Uh, this is what many sole proprietors complete uh, to report their deductions. There are different forms for reporting your business expenses as tax deductions, and it is important to do your research and to verify which forms match your business. Sole proprietors will report to taxes on their personal returns, while other business types uh, will file a separate return. So do some research and then uh, figure out which one you're going to use. Looks like we got another question in here. We do. It says, thank you for your response. I expect to have a lot of sales that apply to my questions, so I would like to get additional information regarding the topic. If I could please be emailed a link on better description on how to properly do that so that it makes sense, I would really appreciate it. Um, yes, I can email the link to the sales tax hub and some other things for you, Steve, okay? Oh, thank you, PJ, I appreciate it. Anytime. So this is that uh, Federal Form 1040C that I was just talking about. Um, if this is appropriate for your business, this is gonna show you part two of the form that will show you a lot of different types of business expenses that you can report. Uh, other forms may have a similar layout, but they have different light items. And again, since we're talking about federal taxes right now, if you have any questions about this stuff, uh, irs.gov is where you want to go for answers for it. Record keeping. Um, tax agencies, uh, Idaho and the IRS, can normally audit back three years from the current year. Uh, however, if you've been doing business without permits, they can go back seven years. Okay. So record keeping is going to be important. So things that you're going to want to keep for at least four years. Uh, receipts, check registers, invoices for sales or purchases, uh, tax returns. It doesn't mean you need to have hard copies. You just need to be able to pull those up. Some records you want to keep for more than four years. Contracts, I would keep those until four years after the close of that contract. And then exemption certificates. Uh, I would go ahead and keep those until they're revoked. So exemption certificates don't expire. Uh, so I just, just keep them. And then contracts, keep those for, again, for at least four years after that. And oh, well, that was an abrupt change. So that's the record keeping. So those are the things that you're going to want to keep. Um, if you end up having employees, then you're going to want to keep things like payroll records, W-4s, all of that stuff as well. Uh, but that's a different class. That is small business. So if you're going to start a business and then you're going to get employees, I would recommend uh, attending the small business one. So I mentioned earlier that there, is, uh, there are places to go for help. Uh, we have a lot of stuff on social media, uh, YouTube. Uh, we're in LinkedIn, Instagram, uh, Twitter. I almost called that the tweet. <laughs> I'm so old, uh, and then Facebook. We also have a newsletter, tax.idaho.gov slash get news. And then we have contact information uh, for tax reps. So the, the folks that PJ works with, uh, you can call us. Um, if it's urgent and you need to talk to somebody right away, I would call. Just be aware that they're very busy, so you may be waiting for a little while. Tax.idaho.gov, that website that I've showed a bunch, um, there is a ton of information on there. Um, you might want to go there first before you try to uh, contact an actual human being. Um, and you can email us. Um, email, have a bit of a delay. Um, and then there's a fax machine. I don't know if anybody still uses faxes, but there's a fax machine. <laughs> Any questions for me or PJ? Okay, so we're going to have Don Altadonis, right? Yes, from the uh, Taxpayer Advocacy Service. Um, she's going to be next. Uh, I'm going to take.
And let's take three minutes, uh, get up, stretch our legs, gives me a chance to switch this over, uh, and then we'll come back. So 9.46, okay? We'll come back and we'll start up with Don, okay? All right. Oh, thanks, PJ. Um, you guys are great with the questions. This is fantastic. <laughs> Usually you have a bunch of bumps on logs that just sit here for a couple of hours. So thank you very much. Um, we're going to have Dawn from the Taxpayer Advocate Service. Let me hand her the magic presenter ball. There you go, Dawn. Are you with us? Trying to be. Can you hear me? Yeah, you're pretty quiet. Oh, is it? Yeah. I know I tried to, last time we did this, um, you could barely hear me. It is louder than them. <laughs> okay. I, yeah, I removed my um, my headphones, and I also had to, to go to location, so I'm actually at home because it was. <laughs> <laughs> anyway. Um, hi, good, at, or good morning. Uh, yeah, late good morning. Uh, I am Don Baltadonis. I am the local taxpayer advocate represents the taxpayer advocate service. Um, a little known, but to um, go part of the IRS. I am going to explain or take a few minutes, make you aware of who you are, do some resources and rights that you have when dealing with the IRS, kind of as a extra resource. You never need our help, but if you know that we are. Uh, especially if uh, there ever comes a time when you've tried to resolve a problem or issue with the IRS, uh, haven't been successful, know that we are uh, consider ourselves your voice at the IRS. Talk about our leadership real quick. Uh, our new NTA, Aaron Collins, joined us right as everyone evacuated in 2020. Prior to becoming our NTA, she was a tax managing director in charge of KPMG's tax controversy services in the Western area for 35 years. So she has a lot of experience handling tax controversies at all levels of the IRS, including exam, appeals, chief counsel functions. She represented both foreign and domestic operations in a wide range of technical and procedural issues. Um, so who we are. Um, again, although TAS is a part of the IRS, we are an independent organization. IRS Restructuring Act of 1998 created the position of the National Taxpayer Advocate and strengthened the uh, TAS Taxpayer Advocate organization by making it in the IRS. TAS provides free service to all eligible taxpayers. Uh, this free service includes individual taxpayers, authorized representatives, businesses, exempt organizations, there are no income limitations for our assistance. Um, I'll discuss what the eligibility means and when to come to us in, in just a moment. So our functions by law, um, IRC 7803 identifies required functions of the Office of the Taxpayer Advocate. Uh, they are, we assist taxpayers in resolving problems with the IRS, identify areas in which taxpayers have problems dealing with the IRS, um, to the extent possible, we propose changes uh, in administrative practices of the IRS to mitigate problems that exist or future problems. We identify potential legislative changes um, which may appropriate to uh, prevent future problems. We did, I think, it was 66 uh, legislative recommendations uh, this year. Um, TAS does this, of course. We take our responsibilities very seriously. I'll discuss how we do these things what we call case advocacy, systemic advocacy, and working directly with the IRS, uh, administrative changes, uh, and Congress for the legislative recommendations uh, our annual report. So we do have a TAS office. By law, we're required to have at least one local taxpayer advocate in each state. Uh, we do currently have more than one TA office in the larger states, California, Texas, work uh, to 
population shift and over time taxpayer issues emerge so we visit those geographic locations and allocations of staffing. Right now we're beefing up the Ogden campus office and uh, hiring more case advocates. So what we do, we protect taxpayers' rights by striving to ensure that all taxpayers are treated fairly, that they know and understand these rights under the taxpayer bill. I think I put that out as a separate handout. Uh, we help all taxpayers, again, not just individuals, where a system or procedure has either failed to operate as intended or efforts have failed to resolve the problem. Qualify for help are your assigned and return and do everything possible to assist you. All that this this process, case advocacy. I'll cover some of our self help tools, go over the taxpayer rights, and explain when to come to us for assistance in just a moment. I'll also tell you a little bit about our systemic problem or our systemic advocacy uh, a little. So we have a new tool, or a new tool. Uh, we have, to see specific examples of how we've helped taxpayers, we do have a separate website, Taxpayer Advocate. Search many different things, but there are success stories that kind of give you examples of. But every year we help thousands of people with tax problems. The following is just a couple of examples of how Resolved and what types of issues that we've resolved. Um, we've re helped others by advocating for an alternative approach to expense verification in a correspondence audit, uh, helping relieve a taxpayer's hardship when they're on hold and they need that to, you know, or, or pay any other bill. Protecting taxpayer rights in an a IRS tax lien withdrawal case, reducing a tax debt when, when it's appropriate. Advocating for a small business to receive a, a return of levy proceeds. We've helped taxpayers victimized by return preparers to get their refunds back. Um, and helping taxpayer validate eligibility for the earned income tax credit, other credits. Um, as I said, we have our website and we're improving it all the time. It has a wealth of self-help information on many tax-related topics. Got step by step instructions on how to work the problem through with um, our website's designed to help taxpayers, tax professionals alike. Parts of it, or actually the majority of it now, is also in Spanish as well as English. Um, and you can use the web screenshot on the slide shows the game Get Help page. You can see it shows a search box section, a what if section by category, by alphabet option to look up your exact issue. Not every topic is shown on the screen, but there are more to choose from. Not shown is a section for our digital tool called Estimators. Uh, this can help you with eligibility for certain healthcare related tax credits, estimate the total credit you make. Um, lastly, at the bottom of the page are two buttons that will take you to a listing of your rights as a taxpayer. Contact us. Once you've chose or chosen the topic closest to the issue that you may be having, uh, you'll see information laid out following form. Description and explanation of the issue, what should I do section, explaining steps you can take to resolve it, a how will this affect me section that explains how the issue may affect you or what would happen if you don't take any action, what are my resources section, that will give you a listing of all resources available that relate to this particular issue, ones that have more information about the topic, ones that link to forms and other products that you may need to take some actions. A what are my rights section that describes your rights as a taxpayer specific, specifically related to the issue at hand. I'll talk more about the rights uh, in your slide. And then lastly, there's a wait, hey, I still need help section <laughs> that explains other options for how and where to get more help. Have information on choosing a tax preparer, if you decide to enlist the help of a tax professional, tips to do if you've hired one but received improper care, or the preparer you chose has performed actions or demonstrated general misconduct. 
which is unfortunately something that every anyone. Our site has information on low cost services for low income and should you need it much more. If you have a, a federal tax related problem, start with our Get Help section. You can go here even if you simply wish to learn more about a specific topic. Next, I'll briefly touch on our taxpayer roadmap. Uh, this is another self-help tool. It's an interactive uh, taxpayer roadmap. Online tool allows you to input a notice number that you may have received and not only see where in the federal tax process you are, but get plain language explanation of why it was sent and how to go about responding to and resolving the issue. Um, we've not at, at this point included every single IRS letter. We've only included the most common ones at this point, but moving it tend to add more information in the future. If you're simply feeling lost in the tax maze that is the IRS or you get specific notice or a letter from the IRS, not sure what it means or what to do about it, we want you to use our uh, taxpayer roadmap tool to figure out where you are and what to do. Help find your way to a resolution. Uh, ways to use it, you can enter the IRS notice number in the search field. This is section view quick links to navigate processing station or you can manually click on different markers or stops throughout the map. So I'll talk a little bit about when to come to us for uh, tax account help. In general, contact the Taxpayer Advocate Service when someone is experiencing some financial difficulty, an emergency or hardship. The IRS needs to move much faster than it usually does or even can. Procedures. In those cases, time is of so if the IRS doesn't act quickly, for example, to remove a levy or a lien, uh, someone will experience more financial harm or irreparable injury. This includes all types of taxpayers, again, businesses too, not just individuals. Many different IRS units and steps are involved. The case needs a coordinator or a traffic cop to make sure everyone is that plays that role. Uh, someone's tried to resolve a problem through normal IRS channels, but those channels have broken down. Response, et cetera. Um, there's a unique set of facts or issues, including legal issues, uh, and the IRS is applying kind of size-fits-all approach. Uh, they're not listening, they don't recognize it for circum certain circumstances. Uh, system or procedure has either failed to operate as intended or resolve the problem dispute with the IRS. A lot of that happening over the last two years, so we've had a lot of uh, nice work. The IRS and them dealing with closures and evacuations is But if you want more specific information on when accept cases, I recommend seeing our website, discussing it. You can discuss it with me, but let me tell you about another new tool that will kind of help you determine if you're eligible or um, get more more information. It's a new interactive tool, an online tool that will help to see if you qualify for our assistance on a tax in issue. Uh, simply just answer a few questions, find it on our contact us page and then scroll down until you see this tool section. If you uh, answer the questions and it doesn't recommend you for TAS case, it's going to point you in the right direction for forms, other uh, tax information to help you resolve the issue. Contacting us uh, for TAS help, qualify for our assistance. There are a number of ways you can request our help. Um, Steve made the joke about non fat and no using faxes. Unfortunately, TAS still use. Uh, we do have, again, TAS helped me with my tax issue tool. Answers yes, you can fax or phone your local taxpayer app. It is listed in the publication 1556, but on the very last slide is our contact information for us in our offices in Idaho. Call the national uh, case intake line, the 877-777-4778. Download the form 911, request for taxpayer assistance, and then you can fax that into us. And again, I'll have the uh, our contact information on the very last slide. So what to expect when working with TAS? Um, as I mentioned earlier, TAS's mission is to advocate on an We'll advocate with you and set 
the IRS. In general, you'd be contacted usually within seven days based on the urgency or hardship that you to us when we've received your inquiry. Um, you'll be given the name and information for a case advocate. The person will be your point of contact until the matter is resolved. When the case advocate contacts you, they'll attempt to clarify the issue, estimated completion date based on the time it usually takes the IRS to resolve similar issues. We're going to request any needed documentation. It's only an estimate and uh, anything. Case completion can depend on the rate, IRS business units that may be involved in the resolution. IRS response time, other things too. But usually, if we request more information but you don't receive a reply, second request in writing, or we will, trying to give you a response due date. To close your inquiry without any other contact if you don't respond with the needed information, because there's really nothing. I always ask if somebody needs our help to provide a really uh, detailed statement of what's happening, provide copies of the documentation or any IRS notices that you've received from the IRS, any documentation that you've sent to the IRS, that'll help us uh, some time. But throughout the case, you can expect to be contacted at least every 35 days. Please have a quick form you of any expected next contact. If you fail to hear from your case advocate, you can just give us a call back. We will give you the intake line and my, my line. It's easier to reach us by um, email. We're starting I've our email address, our new address on the uh, two. But we work cases usually by geographic location, so we work all Idaho cases. But we may also help out some other, for instance, we're helping Montana. Uh, this will not do contact or resolution. We're simply ensuring that this kind of spread is easy as possible out for various reasons. We will address all actions that we take, outcomes, balances due or that are going to be issued. And, uh, we'll discuss any avenues before we close. Also educate you if a cause and how to prevent your problems. Basically, really remember that our services are always free, too. More information, of course, on our, our website. So, a couple slides on what else do we do? As I stated earlier, we also address large-scale systemic issues that affect many taxpayers. We raise these concerns to our senior leaders at the IRS, systemic advocates. They help us tackle the big picture problems in the IRS and, and the tax law by referring Reporting them to us through our Systemic Advocacy Management System, or SAMS for short, irs.gov, SAMS, or put SAMS in the search box. It'll take you to the This system is not for report just your tax um, return or account issue. It's something that I mentioned to a friend that, hey, I'm having this issue with the IRS, and they go, hey, I'm having the same thing. It's something that's probably systemic in nature. And uh, like, you know, if somebody would take the to report it to us, uh, resolve things with the IRS a little faster. It isn't, again, issues, and we never want you to enter um, specific sensitive taxpayer information like a Social Security number or your name. Or, uh, we may ask for a, and a phone number. So, talked about uh, have certain rights earlier, the Taxpayer Bill of Rights. This amplifies the 10 fundamental rights taxpayers have when working with the IRS. IRS adopted the Taxpayer Bill of Rights as proposed by our former NTA. Congress then codified those rights into IRC. Uh, they applied to all taxpayers in dealing with grouped them into uh, Existing rights into the tax code and descend fundamentally. Make them clear, understandable, and accessible. Rights are uh, to be informed, right to quality service, the right to pay no more than the correct amount of tax, 
the right to challenge the IRS's position and be heard, the right to appeal an IRS decision in an instance, the right to finality, privacy, the right to confidentiality, the right to retain representation, the right to a fair and just tax system. Um, each right is further defined. For example, I'll just mention one. The right to be informed says taxpayers have the right to know what they need to do to comply. Entitled to clear explanations of the laws, IRS procedures, and all tax forms, instructions, publications, notices, and correspondence. Right to be informed of IRS decisions about tax accounts and to receive clear explanations of the outcome. Bottom line really is clients, your business, you have rights when dealing with as consistently works to ensure that those rules are respected. Now we're, um, it's a part of the education and training. Um, so a quick couple minutes. Three sentences on the report to Congress. Our, our NTA is statutorily reports to Congress each year and do the end of Objectives report this. She delivers the report to the Senate Committee, Committee on Ways. Review from Commissioner, IRS Oversight Board, Secretary of State. The Congress includes an analysis of the 10 most serious problems encountered by taxpayers, along with legislative and administrative recommendations for solving those problems. For 2021, since um, all serious problems include still processing and IRS recruitment, training, telephone and in-person service, transparency and clarity, filing season delays, online accounts, digital communications, and so forth. It also includes a discussion of the 10 most frequently issues. It does have some really good information. Um, Exactly what TAS is, is recommending to the IRS issues live. The objective report to Congress comes out at the end of this month. It'll just really give a state of TAS and the IRS and our current forward looking to the next fiscal year. So, some a couple minutes on. Other TAS programs are low income taxpayer the LITCs, are another independent and also independent. LITCs represent in a certain level, also need to resolve problems. Uh, they can represent taxpayers in audits, appeals, tax collection disputes for the IRS. Provide information about the tax rights and responsibilities in languages for English as a second language. Uh, their services are offered for small fee. They're listed on taxpayer uh, IRS. Just check LITC in your state. Idaho, unfortunately, we only have one. It's in Twin Falls. Tremendous amount of work for the IRS. Um, another TAS program, these are for uh, tax geeks, I call them affectionately, those that just love recommending solutions um, to them. But it's a taxpayer advocate, the Federal Advisory Committee, who listen to tax issues, suggestions for improving the in this way, taxpayers have another opportunity to provide direct feedback to the IRS through this program. They include all 50 states. We're currently trying to recruit. They have one for District of Columbia. Definitely, if you have somebody who is interested in taxes, likes to talk, a lot of great suggestions and ideas. Definitely head them this way. They uh, and we are uh, currently recruiting for 
Idaho Taxpayer Advocate Panel. And, um, they first usually serve, it's a volunteer position, they serve a three year member, somebody got a pass, federal background check. Um, if taxpayers indicate that they have a visual impairment, resources are available. Electronic versions of many tax forms, instructions, publications, accessible forms, including text, large print, section 508, HTML file, versions of many tax forms, instructions, and publications in Braille, large print, tax form, telephone number, 293676. You have uh, made a, a lot of strides in improving IRS notices and letters. Um, election, a standard print copy of a notice with the alternative media. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, you can attach a form 9000 to your tax return separately to the IRS or call the IRS customer service desk to make this election. Um, Taxpayers filing e filing do not need to send a copy of the form. Um, it's also available to taxpayers who claim the additional standard deduction for the blind tax return last two years issued uh, this letter 9000 between September and October of last year. Letter notifies the form 9000, them on the three. Attaching it to the tax or calling the customer service desk. <clears throat> Taxpayers can call the Accessibility Helpline to answer questions related to your products and services in other. Taxpayers would they may need accessibility assistance uh, can call that eight three six nine zero. Assistance available. Helpline and OPI short. Staff working on the helpline, however, will not have access to tax information, can't tax related questions. They need to refer them to let us help you on IRA. Um, there are multilingual resources, whoops, multilingual resources. Tax information can be hard to understand in any language. It can be even harder if information isn't offered in the language that you know best. IRS is now translating tax resources into more languages. They offer basic information in English plus 20 other languages right now on IRS.gov. Look for a listing of languages near the top of each IRS.gov webpage in the online that you need. Find many tax form schedules, publications, social media challenges, or channels, excuse me, not challenges, <laughs> in multiple languages. As is website resources currently limited to English and Spanish, but we're trying. So don't forget the LITCs are also represent low income individuals who have a dispute with the pride that educational and outreach to individuals who don't speak English. Second language. <coughs> Excuse me. So uh, the IRS has a Form 1040 Schedule LE request for change in language preference. Uh, it, it allows the taxpayers to ask for information in preferred language, and, and there's 20 you can choose besides English. You just complete the form, file it with your individual tax return. Uh, the form is available. Spanish on the IRS web page. Um, if you e-file it again, you don't need to uh, file a paper version. Hey, hey Don. Yes. There's probably not a lot you can do about it, but you're breaking up really badly right now. Uh, where am I? Okay. Yeah. I have just about two slides left. Uh, sorry about that. Again, I'm not sure what's happening with my connection. It doesn't work in the office, and it doesn't work. 
<laughs> I gotta figure out something. Isn't technology um, wonderful? <laughs> so, like I said, I've got two slides left, so I'll, I'll wrap them up real quick. Um, and the slides are available as a as a download too. Um, for interpreter services, if you can't find answers uh, to your tax questions in your language on IRS.gov, IRS can offer more than 50 languages with the support of professional interpreters. This is our uh, OPI services. Um, the provider interpreter OPI service of the taxpayer facing functions, including taxpayer assistance centers during IRS exams, <coughs> in person, and for any questions over the phone related to correspondence exams, IRS representative discussing tax collections, uh, uh, conference calls, etc. So if you need an interpreter to understand, you can ask the IRS employee to phone interpreter service. O OPI is available seven and there is no charge for it. Um, covered a lot of information. Again, this is just want resources for the future if you ever need it, but if you want to know more information, um, taxpayeradvocate.irs.gov, available in your Spanish, the roadmap, um, ask professionals area on our site, Tell your friends, family, find out might need help with the IRS federal tax related issue to go to our website, see if they qualify for assistance, um, or contact us. The very last slide, again, is the one that is most important here in, in Idaho, has our Boise TAS intake number, our e-fax number, and the completed form 911 request for TAS assistance. Our email address, now this is something that is new. Um, include a phone number if you'd like us to contact you, provide specific information about your tax issue, what's going on. Do not send sensitive or personal identifiable information via email. But we will try to reach out and, and call you, uh, provide the phone number, respond back to you and uh, let you know what to do or what information we might need to help you. Um, I did want to give a mention or shout out to um, one of the slides that is available for download, Small Business Tax Workshop, it's irsvideos.gov, small business self-employed. They have eight lessons that are really helpful, filing federal tax, taxes in your new business, Schedule C in small business taxes, filing and paying taxes electronically, Business use of your home, federal taxes when hiring employees, factors, managing payroll to withhold the correct amount of taxes, tax deposit, and filing a return to report taxes, hiring people who live in the U.S. aren't U.S. citizens. These videos are available 24-7. Videos. So sorry about it breaking up. I apologize for that. Again, just tuck our stuff away for a future resource. Hopefully you don't, but if you do, someone you know has uh, know that to be your voice at the IRS. So back to you, Steve. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Thanks, Don. Um, I noticed that when you spoke up, it didn't break up as much. So it might be just a volume level okay, thing. Good. I need to turn up my volume. Yeah, you can just get all the yelling that you've pent up forever. You just get it out when you do these presentations. <laughs> and, uh, I can tell you that's totally not me. <laughs> You're welcome. So, hey, it's 1020. Um, let's take five minutes, uh, get some coffee, we'll buy a break. We'll be back at 1025, and we'll have Irene uh, Gonzalez from the Small Business Administration uh, walk through some great information on what to do when you're getting started, okay? So five minutes, be back at 1025. Thanks. Okay, welcome back. <coughs> Pardon me. So we're going to have Irene Gonzalez next. Uh, she is from the U.S. Small Business Administration. Some great information and tips on how to get your business rolling. So let me get the uh, presenter ball over here. Here you go, Irene. Hi, Steve. Hey, how are you? Hey, we can hear you. 
Woohoo! Okay, good. <laughs> the floor is yours. Awesome. All righty. Well, I am standing between you and you guys and lunch, so <laughs> I will hopefully keep you engaged and as well as give you a few nuggets to take away. So you've actually got some wonderful news today as far as the tax commission, taxpayer advocate. And so as you're starting your business, I would encourage you to create some little folders within your business, whether they be electronic, hard copy, and make pockets of your regulatory folder and put information in there about tax commission, the IRS tax per advocate, if you do, do anything with employees. So have a regulatory folder, and then I'll talk about some other ways to help organize your business as well. All right, so I do start off by sharing some common pitfalls for, for businesses. So unfortunately, businesses who don't have a few things in place we typically see them fail within the first two years. And then, of course, we all know that the first five years are certainly the most challenging for businesses to have that good foundation. And so as you look through these common pitfalls, kind of go through each one and say, where am I at? Maybe cross out something if, if you've got it, circle it if it's um, something that you need to work towards. So lack of planning. So hopefully you've got the research, you've got things figured out as far as what do I need to do for this type of business? Where do I need to go? How do I need to manage it? Take a look at your financials. So if you've saved money or if you're gonna be looking for financing down the road, where you're standing with that. Who have you reached out for assistance? Do you have mentors? Do you have people that you can talk to? Having a business is certainly very challenging and you definitely wanna bounce things off of people. So build your support system. Um, industry experience, having goals. And so I'm going to be sharing kind of a broad spectrum of business planning. I'm going to cover financials. I'm going to cover marketing. And so always keep in mind that all these different components that I'm talking about, if you feel that you need more information on business planning or more on marketing, we have lots of other trainings that you can certainly join. Um, and so, so we'll just kind of touch through these to see if any, any of these that you need to build your business on. All right, now, just the opposite. These are also items that are going to be helpful in helping your business be successful. So we all know that entrepreneurs are disciplined, hardworking. You definitely need to be adverse to risk, right? because it's always a risk when you start a business. Is it gonna work? What am I gonna do if things don't go the way that I planned? And so leverage resources, technology, think big. So think big picture, but also keep it local. So there's also ways that, that we can assist. And so when I say we, I'm gonna be sharing information with you about other resources and places where you can go to get that assistance with you. Um, certainly building a strong organization, delegating skills, and most importantly, being resilient and adaptable. And this, in this time that we're in, businesses really need to create that resilience. We have so many things ahead of us as far as challenges, everything from supply chains, we have inflation, we have gas, increases. We have labor shortages. So there's a lot happening. So it's really, really important to sit down and say, what am I doing right now? What can I manage? What can I make work? But yet still plan ahead. And I'll give you some tips to help with that. Um, really understand your market, your customers, and employee needs when you get to that point. And then as a business owner, you are always looking for ways to be passionate and motivating others. And that's everything from your team, maybe if you have a partnership, and even your suppliers and vendors, because business is all about building relationships. So build that support network. And then you are constantly 
evaluating and reassessing your skills and your goals of your business. So just kind of run through each of those and say, where am I at? What do I need to work on? What do I need to get more information about? All right, so now 10 steps isn't just, just this alone, but these are certainly the ones to start with. So most importantly, define your product or service. And if you say, well, I want to have a landscaping business, great. But what exactly are you going to be doing? To really define what your services are going to be. Are you going to be just doing the lawn mowing? Are you going to be doing the trimming of the, of the bushes and plants? Are you going to be doing sprinklers? Are you going to be doing design landscaping? And so be very specific in your product or service. List out who your competitors are. Are they within a geographical area? Are they, what, how are they different from, from your business? So most importantly is just being able to identify what your niche is because as a customer, or a consumer, I am searching, right? I am searching for companies who do what I need. And do you have those capabilities? If not, then of course we're going to the next one. So take a look at your competitors' websites. How are you comparable? How are you different? So earlier I'd mentioned putting together a regulatory folder. I would also encourage you to put together a marketing plan a financial plan and an operational plan. And I like to throw in a fourth one, which is a cybersecurity plan. And these are all going to roll up into your business plan. We hear lots of comments on business plan and its usage and, you know, what do I do with it? It's this 40 page document that I'll probably never look at, I'll throw it in a drawer. But you have to change the mindset of, I need to plan how I'm going to manage my business. I need to plan how I'm going to utilize marketing. What am I going to say? When am I going to say it? And same thing on your financial side. You need to plan to determine how much money do I have now? What am I going to use it for? When it runs out? Where am I going to get it? What am I going to need it? Need? And, and how am I going to use it? So have those different plans. And if you break them down into those different compartments, it's going to help you not feel so overwhelmed of, of putting together a business plan because you work on different pieces of it. Um, so hopefully you've set up a, a business structure. If not, I'll, I'm gonna share some, some resources with you. So just kind of simple 10 steps, if you will, but I'm gonna go into some more details to help you through those. All right, so just a few individual considerations. So how are you with planning and organizing? We hear a lot of people say, I love the hobby side or the service that I do or, or the, the making that I'm doing. But right in the day-to-day, -day, not so much. And so that's where we really need to, to help you as a business owner is the day-to-day -day managing of the business making sure you have tools in place, if things are automated, but getting that foundation is going to help you run your business and be more successful at it so that you can enjoy that hobby or that service that, that you initially intended so that you can enjoy the business. Um, I threw in getting along with different personalities. We know that's always a challenge, but Putting steps in place to be proactive versus reactive. What happens if these are my steps? Or if this occurs, here's how I, I will handle it. So being known within your community. So if you're just creating the business now, talk to everybody and anybody. Ask them questions, get your feedback. Everyone wants to share information about if it's pricing, if it's the services that are being offered. So gather as much information as possible and see if you have those capabilities to meet your customer needs. Um, if you are leaving a job and now going into business, have you looked at the financials? Have you looked at that steady paycheck of whatever the, the paycheck was bringing in? The business is now going to have to substantiate for that. And then 
is the family on board? Is everyone ready to participate? Managing industry knowledge, and last but not least, if you have not worked on or created a SWOT analysis, I would encourage you to do one of those. And so this is really breaking down what are your strengths, what are you good at, and of course, this is always the fun stuff, right, of the business. What are, the, what are your weaknesses? What am I not so good at? And that could be anything from, I don't understand financial statements. Um, I, I'm not very good at social media. I don't know how, how to come up with good content. And so really identifying what you're not good at is just as important as what you're good at because we all know that if we're not good at something, it's gonna sit on the back burner or we're gonna procrastinate and we're not gonna to get to it even though we know that it's important. So being able to identify what you're not comfortable with, but being able to find where can I get resources or assistance to help me with that, or what do I need to delegate? The O is for opportunities. Now, as a business, you should not be doing all the marketing yourself. Where are other ways that you can collaborate by building relationships and partnerships with other businesses, community organizations, nonprofits, to help you get the word out and to also expand and put you into a larger audience. And then T is for trend, or sorry, T is for threats, both internal and external, that could affect your business from staying open or reaching your customers. And this could be anything from if you have a retail space, what happens if the city decides to do road construction right in front of you? Or if you have an online business, your website goes down and people can't select or, or the payment, something happens there. So build a plan for the what if something happens, how am I going to take care of it? And I do like to add another T, which is trend. Where, what is the trend of the industry? Where is it going? How is it affecting me? And so put, put your own SWOT analysis together and see where you're at. All right, so the light bulb stage is, I've got this great idea. I am ready to go, get this thing started. Where do I go for help? And this is where you can reach out to the SBA, the Small Business Administration, and we are here to help you. And so we are a federal agency, and our sole purpose is to help businesses start. We help them grow by, through our financing or through our loan guarantee programs. We help them expand into new markets and recover through disaster. So if you haven't checked out our website, there's a ton of information, everything from business planning to marketing. There's lots of on-demand on webinars, checklists, Feel free to check that out. If you need any assistance, I can certainly walk you through. So we also offer free business consulting, and I will share those resources with you here in a bit. Loan guarantee programs, which is usually where businesses have heard of SBA, disaster assistance, and then also federal contracting. If you wanted to do business with Mount Home Air Force Base, your land management, we can help you get into the certifications, and then also help you learn the different avenues of government contracting. So this is your page. These are your free business resources and free business consulting. So a lot of people say, yes, I used SCORE when I first started. Well, now you're in year six or seven. Reach out to our resources. Reach out to the Small Business Development Center. These are folks who have either been in business, they have backgrounds in Large corporations could be in HR, could be in accounting. So utilize their expertise. Um, you can also get free trainings and different webinars. So if you go to score.org, they offer lots of on demand and trainings. I actually tapped into several of, of theirs as well. We have a small business de development center. We have six located throughout our state. They're in Post Falls, Lewiston, Boise, Twin, Pocatello, Idaho Falls, and there's two in Eastern Oregon, Ontario, and La Grande. We have a Women's Business Center. We also have a Veterans Resource Center. So there's lots of resources 
and networking opportunities and tools that can help you with your business. So let us get you to those next levels of your business to help you be successful. All right, so new business checklist. As part of your handouts, you should have received a new business checklist because we get this asked a lot. Okay, so I've gone to the Secretary of State, got my business name registered, and I've opened up a bank account, now what? And so that checklist is helpful for you to go through and say, well, I've done three of these things. Okay, now I need to work on the rest. So that's very helpful there. And this is another tool that is also helpful. So Idaho is help Idaho.gov. And it has two functions. One is a business wizard, and it is going to help you identify more of like a electronic checklist. So very similar to the one that I, that I shared, but it's going to give you links to Secretary of State, Industrial Commission, Tax Commission. So a lot of these resources tie into each other. The resource wizard. So business is all about building relationships, making connections, talking to folks who can help, look for ways for collaboration. So if you're looking for agriculture, resources, angel, venture capital, loan programs. There are business incubators if you want to network with other businesses. Chambers of Commerce are also great for networking and collaboration. Economic development organizations in rural communities. Also government contracting, importing, exporting. So lots of great resources if you think wanting to expand your business or look for opportunities. Um, let's see, looks like there was a question. So it's a SWOT analysis, S-W-O-T, which is your strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats. And if you just Google SWOT analysis, you'll see some charts, you'll see some definitions, and those are very helpful to have you really dissect what are some things that could be helpful for your business? All right, legal structure. And so if you already have your structure picked out, whether you're a sole proprietor doing business as whatever the business name is, or you're an LLC corporation. So I don't go into great detail in this area because you choose a structure based either by your tax formation or illegal as far as how much separation do I need from me and my customers for that protection. So definitely talk to a, your tax consultant who can help you identify what's going to be the best for your type of business. But also know that there is a free legal assistance that can help with legal structures. They help with intellectual property. They also help with e-commerce. And this is through the Entrepreneurship Law Clinic from the University of Idaho. And I've listed John Hinton and his email address. John is great. We team up on a lot of trainings. And so if you have any legal questions, there's a free resource that you can bounce some questions off of, off of without actually going into an attorney to, to pay extra money that you may not need to at this point in time. So definitely reach out as far as that legal assistance goes. All right, so a little bit about business planning. So you have a, so your business strategy is, you have a product or service that you have identified. You're selling it to what target market? So have you created a customer profile? Who are you selling to? What does this person resemble? And so what kind of an experience do you want them to have? We all know that as soon as you've attained customers, you want them to come back, and you want them to refer. So how are you doing this? The second one is management team and roles. So if you're the sole owner, what do you do every day? What's your job? So I would encourage you to put a checklist together on what your roles are. What do you need to be doing? Do you need to be ordering supplies maybe every second Thursday? Do you need to be putting together a content calendar for your social media every first Monday of each month. So you can plan for the whole month, let 
have everything scheduled, set in place, so it's automated. And then Sundays, maybe Sundays are the day that you're going to sit down and do your invoicing, or maybe Sundays is, is the day that you're going to figure out, okay, I'm looking at, at my projects, I need to figure out what worked, what didn't last week, how do I plan and prepare for the current week, and then what do I need to plan for the following week? So you're looking at three weeks. So earlier I talked about planning and organizing. Part of this is being able to manage your day-to-day. -day. And also, we're going to be working on a one-year plan. So the next 12 months, you, I would encourage you to, to also put a three-year and a five-year plan together so that you have goals to reach towards and you can visualize and see what they look like. So earlier I mentioned a marketing plan, a financial plan. And then here's some homework for you, customer value. So you may have heard of a phrase called a tagline as you're building your brand. So what would you like your customers to say about you when they hear your business name or your name? That you're reliable, you've got great customer service, that you're a good listener, that you do a great job. So what would you like them to say? Um, let's see, I see a question in the chat. Um, I have an LLC set up. Do I need to write up and offer an agreement I have if I'm only one member? So when you go to the bank to set up your, your bank account, they may ask you for an operating agreement. So it is a legal document. So if it is one person, that really just identifies who the members are of the LLC. If there's multiple people, then, of course, you really want to break out who's doing what because an LLC has members. So if there's two, there's one person who's a managing member. Um, but that definitely is a question that you can certainly reach out to John Hinton about. Um, but if it's just one person, it's not necessarily something that you have to do. But if you are asked, then that may be a reason that maybe the bank is going to ask you for your operating agreement. Um, or maybe it's called articles. Of, so articles of, of incorporation are referred to when you have a corporation. And so no, they are two different documents because they are two different structures. So the articles are referred to a corporation. And then your operating agreement is for an LLC. Um, okay, so here in the middle, part of your business is Part of your business plan is to put together a vision. So, who is the who is this business? Tell your story. When you go on to websites, you're going to see a tab that says about us. That's where you're going to tell your story. We love small businesses. So let us be a part of your business. What do you create it? What do you believe in? What do you stand for? What do you hope to do with your with your business? And so, share your vision. Now, if it's just you, you may want to hire people down the road. So visualize what your organizational structure could look like or what you would like it to look like. At some point, do you want to have an office manager? Do you want to have a salesperson? And then what do you want these people to do? So kind of think through what that might look like. I mean, not necessarily a job description, but what kind of duties could this person do? And then there's data. These are measurables. You have to know what's working, what's not, because you can't change it if you, do, if you don't know what the numbers say. And, that's, and that is the same as far as marketing goes. Because a lot of times people will, marketing, as we all know, is just kind of a shot in the dark, right? You try it for a while, what's your return? You try something different, but you have to have measurables. And then we'll take a look at any issues. So things are going to arise, and when they do, identify the problem, discuss it with your team, and then come up with a solution, but then document it. Create a process, because when it does happen again, everyone knows what the steps are. We all know what the process is going to be. That way we can – so it's helping you create manuals. You know, you'll have an employee handbook that you'll put together. And, the, and then you have protocols of when things happen in the office so that everything is consistent and everyone knows what's happening. 
So hopefully you've got some takeaways here. So a little bit more about the business planning, identify your project service, and then how do customers find out about you? Do you, do you have a website? Do you have business cards? Are you on social media? Word of mouth? So how do people find out about you? And this is where you're going to list them out. And then come up with your company vision, as I mentioned earlier, and the mission. So your vision is what do you aspire to, to become, and your mission is how are you going to achieve that, and then what are your core values? And these are the principles which the company was built on. So again, this goes back to the About Us tab. Tell us why the business was created, what is its purpose, what does it stand for, because we want to buy into your business. And so help us believe and help us understand what your business is and does. Identify your key customers or your market segment, and then list the benefits that you provide to each of them. So just because you created this great product or service, your customers need to be the ones who are going to tell you that. And you want them to speak for your business. Let them do the talking. Because we all know, right, when we are looking for a product or service, we're going to look online, we're going to look at the reviews and see what other people say about it. So let your customers speak for you. Now, here's where we do have some, some challenges right now. So identify your key suppliers, partners, distributors, and what's the role they play in the production and the, and the delivery of your product services. So we all know that there's supply chain issues, right? So what is your backup plan? Come up with an, with an A, B, C, and D, right? If something isn't going to be delivered on time, what's my backup? Am I, am I going to be able to meet my customer needs because my shipment hasn't come in? So come up with your plan for the what if, because we are unfortunately in a circumstance of, of a what if, because things are rising, things are changing, and you can't consistently always increase your prices to cover that. So you do have to come up with that plan, but ultimately you need to be able to cover your expenses. So really, this is gonna be a really intricate time for businesses to sit down with a consultant and say, okay, how am I gonna make sure that I'm going to be able to manage the expenses, but yet make a profit? All right, last one here is competitors. So earlier, earlier I mentioned to have, to encourage you to reach out, take a look at who your competition is, check out their website. How are you different? Because if I come to you and say, well, can you do this for me? And if your response is, well, yes, but, maybe this is, is an opportunity to collaborate with a competitor and say, well, we're referring each other to different customers based on what the need is. So maybe you only want to specialize in an area, but it's okay to refer to a competitor because you're sharing resources. And if it, this is something that we can also talk you through to help you see how to work with other businesses that you really aren't in direct competition with. So definitely check out your competitors. All right, so real basic marketing, know your customers. So are you marketing to the right target market? Two, are, do you really understand your brand? Are you sending the right message to your customers? It is all about branding, but it's also the right message. So what's the content that you're using? How is it being addressed? Is it reaching the right people? And are you selling the experience, not just the business name? You need to sell the experience because we all, as customers, we want an experience, right? Whether we're buying a product or service. And you need to emphasize on what are the benefits, right? Think of how you buy things. You're looking for benefits and an experience. And the consistency is that is addressed across all your platforms. Everything from your website to your, to your social media platforms, in person, so everything has to be consistent. And the right channel, so how are you reaching your customers? And it can't just be, well, I'm on Facebook, or 
I have an Instagram account, which is great, but is that where your customers are? So test it, see where they're at, and that's why you are, marketing is, is like science, right? It's a test market. But most importantly is how to be unique and different. We like things to be lighthearted, humorous, engaging. I need to feel like I can resonate with that and then have it feel understood. So if you're talking way above my head because, so back to landscaping, I just want it to look good. I want it to, to be clean. And if you come in and say, well, I've got this fertilizer, it does this, this, and this, and I'm thinking, okay, yeah, but can it just help my plants, right? So come down to your customer's level, hear them, listen to them, make it feel understood. And then if you've got a website, your information needs to be updated and current. So don't be having Mother's Day specials on your website. Have it show what's happening today. So here on the bottom, WIIFM, right? What's in it for me? Marketing is all about moving people to buy your product or service. So how are you moving people? What are you saying and how are you reaching them? So part of the marketing plan is to identify your, is to create a customer profile. And that's, now a person could say, I market to everybody. Well, everybody is exactly who? Is it someone who's ages seven? Or is it teenagers? You know, is it mothers? Is it fathers? Is it grandparents? So who is your target market? And then what is the value that you're creating for them? What, so if, I'm, if I wanted the landscaping, I'm wanting my yard to look nice when I have family gatherings. I want it to look designed so that I can enjoy it when I'm sitting in my backyard. So what is the value? So you understand their needs of your customer and you're asking questions. Get to know who your customers are because we're going to almost not necessarily dictate, but we're going to could possibly change the way your business drives, or maybe we we're asking, well, hey, do you offer this? It's like, oh, well, I hadn't thought about that, but that's something I might consider. So stay in touch with the industry and also customer needs. So take a look at your competition, cost and price. Now, a lot of times you just kind of like pick a price out of the year, right? Well, I think I'm gonna charge $50 for the lawn mowing. Okay, so what's $50 covering? Is it covering all of your expenses? So go back to your financial, look at that cash flow statement. Should you really be charging 60? Because now you have to make sure you're covering labor and the materials and now fuel that's going up. And so make sure that your cost is associated with your price so that you actually, do you wanna break even? Do you want to make a profit? So that's why it's important to really look at your financials. And then communication is how am I communicating to my customers? How am I reaching them? How am I, and am I listening to what they're saying? And most importantly, have them talk for you. Have them give those reviews. Have them give the testimonials. It can be through a video. It can, it can be testimonials on, on your website. So, Cheaper is not always better, like I mentioned. Now you may have a special, like for the month of June. So if you know that your lawn mowing costs $60, your special could be 50 for the month of June because you want to bring in new customers, knowing that next month we go back to the regular prices. So know where you're at financially before you hit the, hit the ground running because you don't want to up prices three months in because you didn't calculate right. But just make sure that they cover your cost. And again, this is where we can help you. And should you expand, absolutely, that is where your three and your five year plan is going to help you visualize. Now, also keep in mind that whatever you're putting in your plan does not mean that it is set in stone. It's not black or white. A plan is always adjusting and moving due, due to the opportunities. 
this door opens, this relationship presents itself. So always looking for ways to expand your business. And most importantly, have you left a good impression? Your customers are going to let you know. So follow up within the next 24 to 48 hours of making a sale and ask them, were you happy with the experience? Can I answer any questions? Do you need me to explain something? Do you need a different color? Did this work for you? Build relationships with your customers. Everyone's worried about making new customers, right? But once you've attained your existing customers, those are the ones you really need to focus on and to keep close to you. So always follow up with them. So a little bit about marketing plan research. There's lots of sites and statistics and things like that that you can pull as far as what do I want to focus in an area of large families that have kids because that's who my target market is, or maybe it's pets. Um, and so doing some background market research is going to be very helpful. Your libraries have some great business resources. Um, the Viridian Library is called Unbound. It's downtown. And they have a great offerings as far as they have 3D printers. So if you're looking for a prototype, you can create something there. You just pay for the materials. And that's going to be a lot cheaper than having to go have another source make it. So utilize your libraries for great resources, and they have tools to help you with your business. They've got up, like some meeting space if you want to do some one-on-ones. They've also got like big coffee machines too, like if you wanted to do large posters. They also have a podcasting room if you wanted to try that source as well. So definitely reach out to your, to your libraries. So just following up with the branding, remember, Branding is not about you, it's about your customer. So if you want to be their solution, you need to understand what their problems are. What are they experiencing? What's the inconvenience that they have? So if you want to be the solution, understand the problems that they need. So that's where you're asking questions. Reduce their fear or limit the risk that they're feeling. So if I don't know you as a business, how can I trust? that you're going to fulfill my expectations and my needs. So business is all about building relationships with your customers and the community around you. So help me feel comfortable knowing that you're going to do the job that I'm asking you for. And so when you talk to them, you're going to give them a new and valuable perspective. So I just need someone to come out, take care of my yard, right? And then later you say, Oh, I see that you have a space over here. Do you know what you're going to be doing with it? I can also help you design something. Great. I wasn't expecting that, but now that I know, I can certainly think about that. So you've raised my expectations because you shared something with me that I didn't know that was being offered. So help me enjoy the benefits that come from raising those standards. So ask questions about what I'm looking for. How can you better help me meet those needs? And then going back to help me feel understood. And if you're talking way up here, then I'm going to feel like you don't understand me and you're not listening to what, I, what my needs are. So that's where the communication comes into play. You want to make sure, ask the question, okay, so from what I'm hearing, it sounds like you want this to, to be done. And it's like, oh, well, no, I actually didn't mean that. I really meant this. Okay, well, now I have a, a better understanding. So ask for clarity. That's going to help you. Because otherwise, if you've ever experienced this where you've got your customer base and all of a sudden you don't have certain customers coming back to you, well, if we have a bad experience, we're probably not going to tell you why we're leaving. Although we do want to know why so that we can try to fix it. So you always want to hear what your customers have to say and then evaluate it and see, and see what next steps you can take. Okay, so now a little bit about financing. There's lots of different ways to help you finance your business. Everything from microloans, lines of credit, credit cards, friends and family, crowdfunding, investors. So it's really whatever works best for you. We can certainly talk you through each of these. 
to help you figure out what might be the best path. So just a few facts. There are no grants to help you start your business or to expand your business. So should you see any of these come about, bring them to our attention and we will share with you what this actually means. And over the last couple of years, there's been a lot of identity theft and fraud. So really be careful when you see things because you don't want to spend your money if it's not going to give you what you were hoping for. Now, most businesses are financed by friends and family, personal savings, credit cards, things along those, those nature. But my encouragement is when you're putting that financial plan together, let's say you, you've saved $10,000. What are you going to use this money for? How long will it last you? When it runs out, where will you go? How much will you need? And so really having that financial plan is going to, is going to be very helpful. It, should you choose to go to a bank, they're going to want to see projections. They're going to want to see, well, how are you going to pay the loan back? And financing does take longer than we would like. So that's why you need to plan for that. So don't get an urgent of, oh, my gosh, I don't have any money to pay my expenses. How am I going to pay my bills? That's where that plan needs to come into play so that you know where you're at. So as a business owner, you should know where you are at financially at any given time. And I know a lot of times we just send our finances over to the CPA, but keep let them take care of it. And that's okay, because if that was one of your weaknesses, then you've delegated that. But as that owner, you still need to know where you are. Earlier I mentioned that SB has loan guarantee programs, and a lot of times, you, you won't go into a bank and say, I want an SBA loan. You go to the bank and let them know what your needs are, and they're going to be able to say, okay, well, either the bank is going to be able to give you that loan, or if it's a startup, or if it doesn't meet the bank's underwriting policies, then they'll say, okay, well, this is going to be a better fit for the SBA program. And so we guarantee up to 85% and it reduces the lender's risk, and it provides better terms and rates for the borrower. And so should the loan go into default, then SBA purchases that amount from the bank. The bank gets almost all of their money back, and we take over servicing, and we work with the borrower. You can use loan proceeds for just about anything. You just cannot, if you used equity in your home, it cannot be reimbursed or if you have any delinquent payroll taxes, since this is federally funded monies, then you, there are certain things that you do have to abide to. But you can use proceeds to purchase a business, equipment, working capital, could be startup cost if it falls within those lines. But typically, most banks will not finance a business within the first two years because they do want to see at least three years' worth of tax returns. So here's what lenders look for. So the best thing to do is think like a bank, right? They're going to want to see certain things, and they follow what they call five C's of credit. So they're going to want to look at your character, which is what kind of management experience do you have. So that's where your personal resume will come into play. They're going to want to see what kind of cash flow that the business has. And so if it's existing, that this is where the three years worth of tax returns and business financial statements will come into play. If it's a startup, they're going to want to see those projections. So show me projections over the next year or two. And are they realistic? Collateral. Collateral are assets that are, are used to secure the loan. This, this could be equipment, inventory. It could be the um, equity in a personal residence. Then there's capital. So that's a contribution. So it's called skin the game, or it could be an injection. And typically, it's anywhere from 10 to 30%, just like you would put down money for a car or a home. They want to see that you're investing. And then they look at condition. So how is the industry, how is the industry doing? And then what are you going to be using the loan proceeds for? And then credit certainly is part of this, but I would encourage you to check out your credit report 
to make sure there aren't any red flags and get anything cleaned up. And this is where you want to make sure that, because this is where that fraud could come into play and or, and or identity theft. So make sure that you're keeping close tabs on that. Okay, this is where that financial plan comes into play. And earlier I mentioned that you need to know where you are financially at any given time. So part of that is to be able to say, what are those, those time period breakdowns? And I would encourage you to, now some people look at their financials, you know, once a year during tax time, or maybe every six months, once a quarter, once a month, depending on your amount of activity, if you can look at your financials at least once a week, that would be ideal. Now, if you look at them once a month, there are three weeks that you don't know what is going on until you look at that end of month. But if you don't look at your end of month before, then how do you know that you're going to be able to make your end of month expenses? Do you have enough income coming in to cover those? So I encourage at least weekly, because then you know that you're keeping up with those monthly expenses and expectations. So as you're preparing for a lender, they do they are going to want to see a business plan. You're going to want to see the supporting documents of your financials. And then know the questions that you're going to ask. And again, this is where we can help you. We can facilitate. We can go to the bank with you if it's needed. So certainly let us help you through those steps. All right, earlier I talked about building a support system, build your team. These are your cheerleaders that you have that are gonna help you with your business. So have an accountant, someone who can help you with numbers, someone who can help find some red flags and give you some guidance. If they're not someone who can assist you, they should be educating you as well. So you're paying them for a service. And just like with any service provider, you're building a relationship. So make sure that they are there to answer the questions for you and to help you with your business. Now you may or may not need an attorney, but I shared with you a free legal resource that you can start with there. And then if it's something beyond that, then they can certainly direct you, but see if that plays into your alignment. Now there is a difference between a bank and a banker. You go to your bank, you open up your new business account, and as I, as I mentioned earlier, if you decide to get a business loan, create a line of credit to help your business, that's in your commercial lending department. So get to know who those people are and build relationships. You want that banker to be available to you when you're needing funding. Business consultant. I shared resources with you through SCORE, our Small Business Development Center, and our Women's Business Center. So make an appointment, and again, it's a free service. Schedule with them to give you kind of a once over where you're at, and then as your business is moving forward. Insurance, you wanna make sure that you've got appropriate insurance to, to protect yourself and your customers. And if you, most people, they kind of start with the insurance through their house or their car, just to see if they have the right business policies, but then compare, get two others, so you're comparing three. Compare apples to apples when you're asking questions, making sure that you have the right policies to protect yourself. And again, this is where your network comes into play. There could be some recommendations and we can help give you the questions to ask to make sure that you're getting the right policies. And then see if there is a industry organization that that you can belong to. So again, networking and collaboration. There's lots within our state. If you're in manufacturing, there's a Manufacturers Alliance. There's a Restaurant Association. There is a, so this is a really good one. It's called Buy Idaho. And it's for anything, any business in Idaho to belong to. They do, if you, if you do lots of farmers markets, there's a farmers market association. Um, there's lots of different associations, so research, find them. If you're looking for one, feel free to reach out to me. I can certainly give you some suggestions. But again, business is all about building relationships, networking, collaboration. So the more you get out there, then you get to meet people. 
All right, so just wanting to leave you now with a few points. A business is resilient, so that's the basics. It helps business owners be, take on risks and overcome crisis, so you know how to be adaptable and adverse. And be entrepreneurship, so that's being innovative and proactive. So you're assuming risks, you're, you're analyzing them, you're always looking for new growth opportunities and making decisions, so encompassing all. And being digital, we're in a digital age, so you're constantly looking for ways to utilize technology and those resources. You are a transformational leader, so always open to change and you're consistently innovating. So you're always, if this door is closing, look for another one that's, that you can open. This opportunity arises, where could this lead me? And be empathetic, and that is understand that understanding the needs of your customers and also your team. So, hopefully you were able to grasp a few, a few bits of nuggets that could be helpful with your business. And if you have any questions, feel free to reach out to me. If you have anything specific that you're working on, email is the best. And Steve? I'm handing it back over to you. Thank you. Well, thank you, Irene. Uh, any questions for her before we wrap this up? No, you've all gone quiet. I see. <laughs> this was a great webinar, by the way. Uh, we've done this a bunch. We very rarely get the questions that we got today, so I really appreciate that. I like it that you guys are engaged and asking questions and thinking about it. Um, I'm going to go ahead and keep the room open just in case anybody does have a question. Uh, I'll keep it open for probably five minutes or so. And remember that the material is still available for download. Um, there is a lot of stuff that has a lot of links directly to things that we were talking about, so I would recommend grabbing that. If you run into issues where you can't download it, uh, go ahead and shoot me an email at taxtraining at tax.idaho.gov. Uh, it's also in the chat, and I will email it to you in PDF format. And with that, um, oh, uh, I am recording this. Let me stop that. It is going to.